Gia? Hello. What's that you got there? I don't know. My uncle sent it to me. Your uncle the inventor? Yep. The one who invented the umbrella for media showers? And the laser drill bracelet? <laughs> That's the one. Are you sure you want to open it? Wow! What is it? My uncle says it's called Zoom. Gia, don't you think you should read the instructions first? Oh, come on. What could go wrong? Oh, no! I knew it. It says here that it's an assistant for the cataloging, filing, and documentation of geological materials, currently programmed for the study of fossils. That's interesting. It can scan any fossil, record it, and consult the databases in museums and research centers all over the world. <laughs> I'd say it's a little confused. <laughs> you may have access to a lot of information, but you haven't got a clue of what a fossil is. Come on. Follow me. We're going to the Museo Helmine. <laughs> is any evidence of the life that inhabited our planet in the past. No, Zoo. An organism doesn't always have to die to produce a fossil. If what's been preserved is the hard parts of the body of an organism, then we're talking about body fossils. But we can also find other evidence of their biological activity, like eggs, feces... Animal tracks, the burrows they lived in, bite marks... All these fossils are called trace fossils. In fact, one single organism can produce lots of trace fossils in addition to its fossilized carcass. They're traces of the history of life. Very special traces, because the overwhelming majority of organisms disappear after they die. Only a few are preserved when the conditions of their burial are just right. And they have to be at least 10,000 years old to be considered fossils. It takes 10,000 years to make a fossil? Not exactly. Scientists needed to establish a time limit, and that's the limit they chose, which corresponds to the end of the last glacial period. But the process of fossilization normally occurs over millions of years. How is a fossil made? Hmm. Usually, Water loaded with ions slowly filters through the sediment, and it gradually deposits the ions and substitutes them for the original molecules, petrifying the sediment and its contents, turning them into stone. <laughs> I think we're going a little too fast. <laughs> Maybe we'd better see an example. When it dies, an ammonite sinks to the sea bottom, and anaerobic bacteria eat the soft parts of its body. In other words, its body decomposes. That's right. Its shell, thanks to the ocean currents and its hydrodynamic shape, can be transported far from the place where it died and reach an area where sediments are being deposited, and so it's buried. Don't touch it! That would alter the fossilization process. Of course you can't see anything. To be able to observe the fossilization process, we need to see a section of the ground. So if nothing interferes in the process, the sediment that the shell contains binds together, is mineralized, and hardens. It turns into stone. Exactly. Although in order for it to be preserved for millions of years, it still has to pass a lot of other tests. The rock that contains the shell might crack, letting water in and dissolving it. The shell can also be deformed, recrystallized, broken. But with a little luck, those processes won't destroy it completely and will get an ammonite fossil in the heart of a sedimentary rock. And finally, we need some movements of the Earth's crust to lift the terrain. And with the passage of time and erosion, the fossil is exposed. No zoom. Fossilization isn't exclusive to marine environments. In fact, look, a fossil is being made there, too.
If the leaf is buried in sediment and there's almost no oxygen dissolved in the water, the bacteria decompose it very slowly. The addition of more sediment starts the process of petrification. The sediment is transformed into rock and the impression of the leaf is preserved in it. And what about the leaf? Does it disappear? The increase in temperature when it's buried often transforms the organic matter into carbon. That's what's called the carbonization process. Yes, Zoom. Once again, the Earth's crust has to move in order to bring the fossil to the surface. And erosion and the passage of time eventually expose the fossil. That's right. And remember that even though we just saw the process in a quick way, at least 10,000 years have to go by in order to consider any evidence of past life a fossil. Usually what's fossilized is the hard parts of organisms. Bones and teeth in the case of vertebrates, and shells and carapaces in invertebrates. Plants are normally fossilized by parts, a branch, a leaf, a seed, because they break up over the course of their biological existence. Only in very exceptional cases do fossilized animals appear complete with their soft parts. Delicate structures like hairs, scales, and feathers are only preserved when the animals are buried very quickly, like, for example, by volcanic ash, ice, tar, or resin. You can see there's a wide variety of sizes, Zoom, from an insect to a whole mammoth. And to think that we've only found a few, there are entire mountains formed of fossils that we still have to discover. They're like photos of other eras. They provide us with a lot of information about the diversity of life in the past, but it's a fickle record. Some species have left us lots of fossils, while others have left us very few or none at all. It's like reading and analyzing a mystery novel that's missing some pages. And that's where paleontology comes in. That's right. A fossil is important, but so is the geological context where it's found. Some are really peculiar. So peculiar that in ancient times, before paleontology and geology had been developed, people interpreted them in all kinds of fanciful ways. The ancient Greeks who found these fossilized elephant skulls mistook the opening that connects it with the trunk for a single huge eye. And so they created the myth of the Cyclops Polyphemus. The pyramids of Egypt were built with a limestone full of numulites, a kind of fossil in the shape of a disc. In the past, people thought that they were the lentils eaten by the workers who built the pyramids. Some lentils. The legend of the Minotaur that terrorized ancient Crete may very well be related to the fossilized bones of large vertebrates found on that island and the presence of dinosaur tracks to the legends about dragons. Wow! Spain is a country rich in fossil sites. You're not kidding. You'd like to get to know them, wouldn't you? The truth is that you need experience to be able to identify fossils. But there are so many sites. Well, we could select a few, distinguishing between marine sites and continental sites, and going from the oldest to the most recent. What do you say? Great! First destination, marine sites. Five hundred million years ago, this whole area was underwater and formed part of the continental shelf of the supercontinent Gondwana. I know it's hard to believe it, but the ocean reached all the way here. Look, you see those odd shapes in the rock? Those are ripples from the waves. And in these rocks, we can find fossils of... <laughs> That's right, Zoom. Astropolychnus. Here they are. Traces of where sea anemones were attached to the substrate in the past. Would you like to see the trace of the largest sea worm in the world? Wait for me, Zoom! 
This giant sea worm was more than one meter long and some 20 centimeters in diameter. Its body wasn't preserved, but the burrows it dug were. Way cool! What did you find? Very interesting, Zoom. Those are Cruziana, bilobed traces attributed to the movement of trilobites across the muddy sea bottom. They look sort of like marine wood lice. The impression of the Cruziana was left on the sea bottom, formed by soft sediments like clay or mud. Later, it was covered and filled in with fine sand that was compacted, preserving the trace in positive relief. There are gazillions of them. Well, just wait till you see the Ammonites in Teruel. What do you think, Zoom? Shall we go? reached all the way here, too. And further up. The site is very high, but thanks to erosion, we can find fossils in much more accessible areas. Look, here they are. Belemnites, gastropods, brachiopods, and bivalves. Although they may look like snails, ammonites are actually related to today's cephalopods. Like octopuses and squid? Yes, although with the passage of geological time, most cephalopod species lost their external shell. They all lived in the ocean, while on dry land, the big protagonists were the dinosaurs. We still have a lot to see, Zoom. But we'll get there. First, you're going to see an accumulation of fossils that's much bigger than a dinosaur. After the extinction that took place between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, about 66 million years ago, the warm seas in the early tertiary period were full of organisms. They're nubulites! Etymologically, stones in the shape of coins. The ones they mistook for the lentils that were eaten by the workers who built the pyramids. Right. These single-celled organisms are unusual for their size. They could be up to 10 centimeters across, much larger than the rest of the single-celled organisms, which are usually microscopic. You can see them perfectly here. Sometimes the accumulation of fossils is so big that they form rocks, or even reefs, like the Santa Pola Reef. <laughs> During the Mycenaean, some six million years ago, the Santa Pola mountain chain was a large coral reef located about 20 kilometers off the coast. Later, the connection between the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean was cut off. The Mediterranean became an isolated sea that dried out after about 1,500 years. Goodbye, corals. I'm afraid so. Although at the start of the Pliocene, the Mediterranean was reconnected with the Atlantic and was flooded again new marine fauna arrived, including corals, but from cold, deep waters. Today, it's completely above sea level because of the lifting of the Earth's crust, and it represents one of the best examples of a fossilized reef, a bioconstruction formed by various types of corals. It's a coral mountain. I don't know, Zoom. Are you sure? Gia was right to be skeptical, Zoom. That's not a marine organism, but rather the pollen of a land plant. That's what you get for being a smart aleck. I think it's time to visit some continental sites. made? Mm -hmm. About 300 million years ago, the Iberian Peninsula was located close to the equator. 
The whole Liberian Peninsula was covered with tropical forests and swamps. And that huge buildup of plant matter is the starting point for the formation of coal. And for the fossilization of plants, I suppose. That's right. Look around you. There are all kinds of plant fossils. Impressions in the rocks, external molds that reproduce the external shape by surrounding a tree trunk or branch with sediment, and internal molds when the plant matter decomposes and is filled in with sediment. What a variety! And that's not all. Primitive amphibians and sharks developed in association with these ecosystems. This is where the Iberospondylus comes from. I've seen it in the museum. This amphibian is one of the first species to emerge onto dry land on the Iberian Peninsula. You're running out of power. Coal is a source of energy, but I don't think it will do you any good. Maybe we should go back to the museum. It's a shame, I know. We'll come back some other day to see the dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, okay, let's go! No, Zoom! These fences protect the site. Too often, not only looters, but even some tourists take fossils as souvenirs without taking into account their scientific importance. Don't worry, Zoom. I've asked for permission for both of us. 127 million years ago, Dinosaurs lived in this area. Because there was a large wetland with ponds and lakes, it was possible to preserve some traces and skeletons. Look, Zoom! Dinosaur footprints! <laughs> no, Zoom. They're not here. The dinosaurs' bones have already been studied, and you can see them in the museum. Besides dinosaurs, a great diversity of animals and plants has been found in Las Ollas. Some of the most fascinating finds involve fossils that have preserved mineralized soft tissues, like, for example, vertebrate mussels. <laughs> no, there weren't any giant sparrows. In reality, the Iberomasornis was much smaller than this reconstruction. There you have it, Zoom. The original remains of a concavenator corcovatus. Original? Usually replicas are put on public display, but in this case, these are original remains. Look closely. You can see perfectly the impression of the foot pad and the scales on the animal's tail. It's called corcovatus because the animal had a hump on its back caused by the extreme length of a couple of its vertebrae. And those other tiny vertebrae? Those are the remains of another little reptile. And look, you're going to love this. In one of the bones of its forearm, we can see some structures that were probably the insertion point of some protofeathers, the forerunners of the feathers found on today's birds. Amazing! All thanks to the stagnant water, the elevated accumulation of organic matter, and the absence of oxygen. What's more, the metabolic activity of the bacteria mineralized the soft tissues and preserved them exceptionally well. I thought microorganisms only contributed to the destruction of the remains. Not always. Sometimes they collaborate in fossilization in a very efficient way. Some of them, like bacteria, can even preserve fossils. Have you ever heard of El Soplao? The cave of El Soplao is a unique environment for the preservation of microorganisms. Without any other available source of energy, the bacteria made use of the manganese dissolved in the water of an underground river to form stromatolites. No, those aren't stromatolites. Those are calcite and aragonite crystals. So what's a stromatolite? Generally speaking, it's a layered rock produced by bacterial activity. 
That means that in the case of El Soplao stromatolites, it's the bacteria that cause the minerals to precipitate. That is so cool. Above all, if you think that a bacterium is 100 times smaller than the breadth of a hair. We should go back to the Museo Geominero. I don't want the adventure to end either. But one more dip in power, and we're going back with no complaints, OK? Zoom! Look, Zoom, we're finally here. That's the visitable site of Fonelas. Two million years ago, this landscape was very different. That's right, Gia. It was a great plain inhabited by certain large mammal species. No, it's not your battery, Zoom. They're Asian and African animals that were found in Granada. Which shows that in the Pleistocene epoch, the local fauna coexisted with Asian and African immigrant species. Mammoths, rhinoceroses, cheetahs, deer, wolves. Although the giant hyena is the star of this site. This is where they fed. Here, over the plain and close to the riverbed, they left a lot of bones. We can see the distinctive marks of their teeth on the bones. What's more, since the hyenas preyed on a wide variety of species, here they brought together a broad sampling of the fauna that lived in this ecosystem. They've even found a mountain goat that was dragged here from the nearby mountains. And humans? Haven't we left any fossil records? Of course, but remember that we've been following a chronological order in our visit to the sites. And the history of human beings, geologically speaking, is very recent. The whole of the Atapuerca mountain chain is a karstic system. Water dissolves the limestone, creating caves that sometimes open onto the exterior making them a perfect refuge for humans and animals. It looks like Swiss cheese. It sure does, Gia. The bones of the animals that lived in these caves were left behind and eventually covered with new sediment. Producing fossils. This is where we find 90% of the world's hominid fossil records discovered to date. This cave is the first site that they excavated. Here they found animal remains and stone tools associated with Homo heidelbergensis, which indicates that these hominids were very knowledgeable about their environment. They made use of the natural traps produced by the fissures in the rock, and they ate the meat of the animals that fell into them. Now that's using your head. In the fissure known as the Cima del Elefante, or the Elephant's Chasm, they found the first European who lived here 1.3 million years ago. They're the oldest human fossil remains found anywhere in Western Europe. Grandolina is undoubtedly the best known site because it's where they found hominid fossils more than 900,000 years old that belong to the species Homo antecessor. What's more, here we can find a continuous sequence of sediments covering a time span of a million years. What are those marks? <clears throat> they were made by a stone tool that hominids used to cut flesh from bone. Humans used to cut flesh from human bones? That's right, Gia. I'm afraid our ancestors were cannibals. Miguelon too? No, Gia. Skull number five, popularly known as Miguelon, belongs to the Homo heidelbergensis species. And those hominids lived in socially tight groups that took care of their elderly members and of the weakest ones, too. Zoom, could you lend us a hand? Are you all right? This is a Homo heidelbergensis that lived 500,000 years ago. It was found in 1992 at the Cima de los Huesos, or Bone Chasm, and it's the most complete fossilized skull anywhere in the world. Awesome! Zoom, Zoom, watch out! You scared the daylights out of us. You could have fallen into a chasm, and who knows? You could have become the first robot to go through the fossilization process. Well, it's not that simple. Remember that lots of factors come into play to control the fossilization process. 
we humans are barely a blink in the Earth's history. Although, thanks to fossils, we can go back in time millions of years to discover the origins and evolution of life on the planet. You hit the nail on the head, Gia. Paleontological research proves that evolution is a fact. The history of life is marked by the extinction of groups of organisms and the appearance of other new ones. But all living beings share a common ancestor, and that's why they also share a kinship that connects all the species. Speaking of kinship, Zoom! What are you doing, Zoom? You can't be fossilized! <laughs> A fossil is any evidence of the life that inhabited our planet in the past and has been preserved in rocks. And you're not a living being. <laughs> Come on, Zoom. I didn't mean to offend you. I know you've got feelings. Don't be like that. We still have a lot to discover. That's right, Gia. The record of the history of life is a novel with a lot of exciting pages left to be read. Come on. Don't be so stubborn. Come out of there. Come on. Do it for me. Zoom. 